with Beth Harris and Frank DeBell, an art historian in, in Rome and we're standing outside an extraordinary church. We're standing in the middle of traffic, essentially. Yes. We're really we're in the heart of the city. Not quite a traffic island, but we are in the midst of Rome. We're very close to the Pantheon and 10 minutes from the Forum. And that explains the centrality of this church, founded as the mother church of the Jesuit order in the mid to late 1500s, after the death of St. Ignatius Loyola, its founder. And the church is called the Jesu, which simply means Jesus, and this uh, is a glorification of the name of Jesus. And you can actually see it right there emblazoned on the, on the facade of the yes, church. Yes, the IHS, which is sometimes read in Latin, sometimes in Greek, as an interpretation of the letters of Jesus' name. And we also see the name of the patron. The name the of the patron is very important, Alexander Farnese, an enormously rich, powerful, and art-loving cardinal. I might add, we're standing in the pouring rain, so I Should think we it's run time to go inside. I think let's run in. As we walk in here now, although the color is gorgeous, it's, it's softened because it's dark. It's dark today because it's, it's cloudy. As you can hear, we're still in the heart of Rome with, with the <laughs> sirens going by. <laughs> but this is the point. The sound of it reminds me. This is something that is turned up loud. Yes. This is loud and it's loud and clear. This is a very rational space. With it all, with the Baroque's appeal to, many people have said, to the imagination rather than the intellect, this is really a delight for both the senses and the mind because there is a sense of focus and it's not a complicated space. We come back to that name of Jesus on the ceiling, which, which encompasses the theme of the whole church. So it seems as if that notion of simplicity that, I don't, I, you could never use the word spare here, but you can say that there has been a sort of removal of, th through the Council of Trent. Yes, well the Council of Trent wanted directness and simplicity. This looks very ornamented because it's the materials themselves, but if you analyze the materials, you could even say that they're spare because they're classicizing. Yes. They are the kind of uh, fluted Corinthian columns and pilasters that we would see in Renaissance churches. Yes. It's just that they're made of Sicilian jasper and ochre marble and all sorts of other rich materials, some of them actually spolia, that is, recycled pieces from uh, ancient Rome. Well, we don't know exactly what, but it was a common practice to, to rebuild the new Christian Rome out of its ancient, quote-unquote, pagan past. So we've got this total focus on the altar, the real removal of the aisles as a space for traffic. Yes, there's or, a space for individual chapels on the sides, but the, the emphasis is on the great space. And above us, of course, this huge, uh, explosive ceiling with frescoes. And the far ends, the name of Jesus in a starburst made of gilded bronze. And both of them relate very closely to something that already existed in Rome in, in the earlier Baroque period, and that is Bernini's great apse decoration in St. Peter's, where you have a similar burst of mm -hmm. uh, light mm -hmm. coming in that case from the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. the dove, there's a piece of stained glass there. Where and, the wall uh, dissolves. Where the wall dissolves. This is, this is going through, from right? the earthly to the heavenly, from the secular, from us standing right. here to the sacred, of course from matter to spirit, but it's made of raw matter, it's made of stucco. Some of it is very cheap material, it's just painted stucco, but it's theater, and that is what we do. Even when we go to the theater in the movies, we explode out of our terrestrial being, right. temporary. We suspend our disbelief. We suspend right. and we move into that other realm. And this is indebted hugely to Bernini. So there's this really beautiful sort of coming together of architectural space, of painting, of sculpture, of stained glass, of color. gilding, of color. There's just all of these sort of elements that become a kind of beautifully synthesized whole, as you said, which then suspends our belief in it. Here what we yeah. have is not just a sky that goes to infinity with clouds and an ultimate glow, a, a spiritual glow, of course, it's not just the sun up there, but it's, it's heaven. But the borders are ambiguous. And during Renaissance art, and certainly medieval art, this ambiguity was just out of the question. Nobody would say, well, mm -hmm. should we shade it this way or that? Everything had to be clear. By this point in the history of art, also people knew what they were looking at, I think, in a, in a more simple way. And it was fine to make things ambiguous. And we don't know whether we're looking at shading up there or right. painting right. of shade. We don't know for a moment. I've seen many people stop here and wonder whether those cherubs and angels are made of solid material or painted. Well, and in fact, the fresco yeah. extends on wooden and um, other boards. It's like stage machinery and stage sets out of that central space and actually partly covering well, the, the vaulting of the ceiling. On top of that, a glaze, or uh, in fresco we would just call it a wash of darker paint, extends actually onto the architecture 
and oh, creates the illusion shadows. that we're seeing the shadows from those clouds. I think about that joining of the spiritual realm and the earthly realm that happens in the Baroque so often. But this is the church triumphant. The name of Jesus is the one thing we must follow. But if you are blind to it, if you reject it, if you refuse it out of being a different religion, of course this is where it gets very political, or uh, mm -hmm. just uh, ignorance or obtuseness, you are the, the rejected and you're even the damned. And you are those figures who are falling out of that sky into shade, into shadowed areas up there already, and ultimately falling down down to earth and below that into hell. Uh, a triumphalism is, is the theme here. And it's not just in the 1600s, but it was established before that because the Protestant Reformation, which grew through the 1520s and 30s, is now over 100 years old. And we have major wars of religion in Europe where hundreds of thousands of Christians are killing other hundreds of thousands That's of Christians. Right. This was a very dramatic moment yeah. in, in European history. It's very hard to imagine, I think, that moment in European history, that moment of, you know, you must take sides, mm -hmm. and that need to be so certain of your faith, in a way. And I feel that here. I feel that kind of, like, well, here we are in power the, in, of certainty. And we are, right? we're in the heart of Rome. I mean, yeah. this, this is the, the, the place And to, I think it's, it's not difficult to politicize it. In fact, we would say, for some people, of faith today, the art exactly mirrors what they believe. This certainty, mm -hmm. the structure, the discipline of it, and death, the afterlife, that ultimate aspiration that everyone has to go to somewhere peaceful, secure, right. and everlasting, mm -hmm. is expressed here with absolute certainty. Mm -hmm. We're seeing this as a question of light and dark, uh, as tourists or as pilgrims, but just visually. And we forget the element of pure sensuousness that comes from music, from the smells, incense, fresh cut flowers, and all of those elements put together with uh, the ritual with the of the mass and yeah. the art and the architecture. And actually the point you're making about the ritual of the mass is critical because it's, it's those smells, it's the color, it's all of that sensuality, but it's also the fervor of those around you. It's, it's the intensity well, it of that then, experience. It then becomes emotional, and uh, and there we have that, that old formula about Baroque art right. you know, appealing to the emotions rather than to the intellect. And or I it think is, about it, it appealing true. to the body. But this well, is to the guts, because yeah, when exactly. we come in here, when those lights are suddenly put on, even that grabs us. Christianity is a mystery cult, and that is something that is incomprehensible, literally, and it can only be received through spirituality, and we would say through emotion, through poetry, through all the things that are not purely rational, but this is a, a really theatrical blend and it's a very, very powerful one.